this is our Father, this is our God that we're praising. And you know, during worship, I had such a strong sense, a reminder of who our God is. A reminder that He is a Father that can never fail us. Our earthly fathers may fail us, may disappoint us, may abandon us, may leave us, but it's because they're human. But our Father in heaven can never, ever do that. He is with us all the time, through the good, through the bad. And I want to share with you Psalm 125. I love this verse. What a beautiful picture. It says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, both now and forevermore. Can you just picture that? As the mountains surround Jerusalem, that is how our Father surrounds you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Our God is with us in the valley, in the deepest, darkest part of our lives. He's with us on the mountaintop when things are going well. He's with us always. He's our Father. What an incredible Father we get to praise this morning. He is always with us. Father God, we thank you this morning that we can come into your beautiful presence. Thank you that we can bring our songs of praise, of worship and exalt your name this morning because you are such a good, good Father and we praise you. We praise you for how you've created us fearfully and wonderfully. We thank you that you call us your sons, your daughters. We thank you that you have an incredible plan for our lives and we thank you this morning that we have the freedom to praise you and to honor and to lift your name on high we love you so much in jesus name we pray come on give him a shout of praise this morning thank you lord praise god praise god well good morning and welcome to journey church why don't you turn to someone next to you tell them they're looking so fine this morning tell them happy father's day welcome to journey church It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. So good to be in worship together with you, church. Well, welcome. I want to share a few announcements this morning before we get to our special and most valuable dads in the house today. We have something special for you as well. But before we get to that, just a few announcements. The first one being so important is for any first-time guests that are visiting us here at Journey Church. We just want to make you feel welcome this morning. And so if you are visiting us for the first time, there is a guest pack for you at the information desk. You can just grab one on your way out. It's got more information about us as a church. Why don't we give them a hand for anyone here who's here for the first time. Pray that God would deposit something in your heart, a seed in your heart this morning, and that He would speak into your heart this morning. Well, just a quick feedback. Last week on Youth Day, we had a Youth Day here at church. We had a movie day for the young ones. We had about 40 young kids coming together. It was so much fun. They had popcorn, they had pizza, they had Smarties, they had games. It was lots of fun. And so just a great, great initiative to actually put into our youth to grow the youth of this church. So I want to encourage you also, if you have young ones, when we have our next youth event, keep your eyes open for that and then make sure your little ones are there. This is our future generation of this church. And so let's also be praying into all our kids ministry, our explorers and our youth of this church. Amen. All right, then your favorite one today, your favorite announcement is this one. Walala, wasala, right? You snooze, you lose. And so this is just an announcement to say again that we will be closing our gates at uh, from the 3rd of July, 10 minutes after each service. Now this is not to spoil the fun. It's not to take the fun away from you. It's actually to protect you and to help you. And so the reason that we do this is because God matters, people matter, and safety matters, right? We want to give God our best and not be walking in here halfway through worship. We want to give Him our best. And what a, you know, you don't want to miss worship. That's a time where God prepares your heart. And so let's value God, let's value one another, and let's be here on time. Amen. Good. We can do it. Come on. And then we are having a serve day on the 16th of July not the 18th as previously announced, 16 July, that is a Saturday. Uh, You can sign up for that at the information desk and we will send more information about that soon. 
And so we will just spend that day serving our community, serving the city of Frenigen and loving on them. It's going to be great. And now for our amazing fathers in the house. If you are a dad in the house, I want you to stand up, please. Stand to your feet. If you're a dad, come on, let's give them a hand. Wow. Great. We love you, dads. We honor you. You are very much needed in society, in your family, in this world. And so stay standing. There will be someone coming around giving you a gift, a wonderful chocolate. Don't worry, it's not broken in half. Some of the dads in the first service are worried that it's broken up. It's two chocolates in one. It's not broken in half. <laughs> and so enjoy that. But stay standing for a moment. I can share with you one dad joke that I have if you want to hear it. Would you like a dad joke for Father's Day? Okay, the joke is... What do you call a dog magician? A dog magician. You call him a labracadabrador. <laughs> uh, I'll leave the dad jokes to the dads. I think they do them the best. Right, so does everyone have their chocolate, all the dads? There's some more dads aside. Once you have your chocolate, just in a moment, I'd love to pray for all the dads, but there's something else Hidden. All right. Who does not have a chocolate, dads? There we go. That side. There we go. Des is on a mission to get all the dads a chocolate this morning. Thank you, Des. Thank you, team. There we go. Well, fathers, we do love you. We honor you. But you'll see that on one of the chocolates... If you lift the flap, one of them have a special sticker, and that is for our prize for one dad today, is receiving a 500 Rand voucher for Micah. And so if you have a smiley face sticker, please put up your hand. Please tell me, yes, there we go. <laughs> well done, congratulations. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, well done. Fathers, for a moment, let's stay standing. And if everyone can just extend your hands, let's pray for our dads. I'd love to read this beautiful prayer for our dads this morning. And let's just receive it with open hearts this morning. Dear God, thank you for all the fathers and father figures in this church and for all the many ways that you use them to lovingly guide others to your heart. I ask that you would bless them and give them great joy and peace. And may they see you and know you in new ways. Show them how much you love them and care about them. Guide their steps, use their hands, and make them a blessing to others as you continue to fulfill your special purpose for their lives. Lord, give them wisdom and grace as they lead their families and themselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's keep our eyes on the screen. Fathers, this is for you. Happy Father's Day. And to all the single moms, amen. amen. <laughs> no jokes. The single moms that father, hats off. And so guys, I want to know, what did you get in bed from your kids this morning? Dads, shout out. What did you get? Socks? Handkerchiefs? Guess what I got? I got a, the biggest spoil I've ever got on Father's Day. Candy floss. Either my kids are creative or my wife is creative. No, 
Credit to the kids. Well, just a warm Father's Day to all of you, and God bless you. Um, fathering is a privilege. It's, it can be tough, and you know what? I'm always reminded that God has never called me to be a perfect dad. It's impossible. I can be a good dad, never a perfect dad. And so, guys, don't always try and evaluate everything about how you father. Just, just keep leaning on God and saying, God, help me to father with your heart, the best that I can. And so I'm going to jump straight into uh, what I have prepared for this morning. And I really, really, really believe that this is going to help you. Who's in a difficult season in life? Honestly, like, please, hands up if you're facing some kind of difficulty, okay? Um, what would you say um, if God would say, he'll help you, but over a period of eight years? <laughs> so he'll say, I'll help you in whatever you're struggling in, but I'm not going to do it immediately. I'm going to do it over a period of eight years. Would your tone change? Would your heart be despondent? If you thought, but, but God, I know you can do it in a second. Why can't you do it for me now? And God would say, well, I'll help you, but maybe over a period of eight years. And so I think we can all agree that we love it when God works in the seconds, when God works instantly and he just does things and brings people across our paths or open doors or does things that even surprise us, that just, wow, God did that so quickly. But we often struggle with what God does over the long run when it takes seasons. But who knows that both are good and necessary. We can't just live with God doing things in a second all the time, all the time. You know, someone once described our generation, I'm not sure which generation, mine or younger, as the popcorn generation, where we want everything so quickly, hey? And like you, you put instant popcorn in the microwave for two minutes and you stand there thinking, come on, come on. It's taking two Come on, you know, have you ever made original popcorn? It takes a little bit longer than two years. And you know, this, this thing, two years. I make good popcorn. You know what I'm saying. But um, we, we want things so quickly. And I think we're going to sell ourselves short if all we want God to do is to do things quickly. So much of what God does in our lives happens over the long run. I think for many of us, who, who enjoys listening to Queen? Good old 80s, 90s rock and roll. And, and he had a song, I Want It All. Who knows the lyrics? I want it all and I want it. No. Hey. <laughs> who, know, who knows the song and would like the microphone? Jared, you can come up, Jake. Oh, no. <laughs> the guitarist is saying, please, no. But um, isn't it true? We want it and we want it now. We want it now. Uh, we don't often choose the long road, the expensive way, or the difficult way in life. Most of us, I do it too, we, we say, where's the shortcut? What's the quickest way that I can get this done? Who's with me? Or am I alone? We're like, why should it take two years? I can do this now. If I can just jip with this thing, I'll just make a plan and I'll, I'll, I'll cut down the time. And instead of two hours, I'll make it two minutes. Or two years, I'll take it down to two months. Think of fast food. Some meals can take you two minutes. Who knows that it actually takes three minutes to make those things? It's not two-minute noodles. It's actually three-minute noodles. <laughs> okay? But, but what's the quality of that meal? Listen, you and I know it's not the best. Who enjoys two-hour meals? I'm getting spoiled. My in-laws told us what we're having for lunch today. I can't wait because I know that that thing took more than two hours to make. And what's the difference between two-minute noodles and what my in-laws are going to give us today for lunch? time. they both food, they both meals. The only difference in quality is the time that was put in to make them. Let me ask you it this way. Think of a sick person. Which one would be better off? The person who is healed instantly or a person who is healed over a period of eight years with treatment for whatever they're suffering with? Who's better off? No one. <laughs> They, they both get healed. They both get what they wanted, but one happened quickly and one happened slowly. And so the only difference was time. Who knows there's no shortcut to a great marriage? <laughs> Everyone's married. Yeah. There, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut to a thriving business. It's impossible. It cannot happen. They say any average business takes about two to three years just to get off its feet. Okay, you and I both know that to have a flourishing faith, 
There's no shortcut. You and I can't become awesome disciples in two weeks. We would like for that, but it's a lifelong process where we journey with Jesus and more and more we're shaped into His image. There's no shortcut to these things. And I've learned that more often than not, what God does in our lives is not in the seconds, but in the seasons. And yet it's the seasons that we actually struggle with. And I honestly believe that if, and I said it earlier, if if we just want God to work in the seconds, we may miss out on some of the sweetest moments in life. I want you to think for yourself some of the seconds and seasons that you faced. Quickly, just go back and think the, the things that happened quickly. Was it an accident? Was it a promotion? Or what happened over a season? A good season? A bad season? Not every, We almost think seasons are always bad. No, there's seasons that are prolonged that are good seasons that your heart almost longs for. Like, I want to go back to that season when we lived there or when I had that job or, or something. What are the seconds and seasons that have defined your life. I think some of mine, quickly, you know, I graduated in 2007, and what followed was a 10-year period of me working, freelancing, lecturing, launching a second business, having children, taking over a church. There was a whole lot of stuff, and for most of it, it was quite difficult, and it was like a bit of an uphill battle, but there was a defining moment in 2018 when, uh, after a long period, uh, Maria and I went full-time into ministry, and it almost changed in a second, it was literally a defining phone call that made everything shift. And it felt like overnight, this 10-year struggle just disappeared. I was like, where did those 10 years just go? And we just stepped into a new season. So there was the seconds and there was the seasons. As m- many of you know that before I became a Christian at age 21, back in 2005, I faced about a two-year period of depression that was scary It was overwhelming. I had to endure and push through. And I thought, is this ever going to go away? I got invited to a Christian camp that Saturday night. I got to sit with the pastor. I don't remember anything I told him. All I remember is I did not cry. I weeped in front of that man. And and what was actually happening is it was me surrendering my life to God and just saying, God, I can't do this anymore. And God picked me up. He made me a new creation. And and here I am 17 years later. And it was this two-year period almost just disappeared. In the moment that I just surrendered in a second, I think of pastoring the church. I love the highs of church. When someone shares something good, we oh, we rejoice together, or we have a fantastic Sunday, or there's a, a cool event that was really good. Then we celebrate what happens in the seconds, but I, I've learned to value more of what God's doing over the long run. Each year seems to get sweeter and sweeter, and sweeter. And so when it comes to seconds and seasons, I want to say this. God uses seconds to grab our attention and seasons to build our faith. Would you agree? God uses seconds to arrest our attention, to remind you, hey, here I am. I haven't forgotten about you. I can surprise you. And it's, it's lovely getting those surprises from God. But God uses the seasons, those long runs, to build our faith. Let's read from Ecclesiastes Chapter 3, it says, and I need your help, there is a time. There is a time for everything and a season. Everyone, there's a? Everyone, there's a? You need to know that you're in a season right now. I don't know what that season is, but you are in a season, and our seasons can be different, and you need to help, you need God's help to understand what season you're in. It says, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You see, you are in a season. Do you know what season you're in? I think it's so important that we learn to be honest with ourselves. I've met many people, hopeful Christians, faithful Christians, and I know what they're going through and their life looks terrible. And I say, well, how are you? And they say, I'm fine, brother. Good. God is faithful. I'm like, you're lying. I'm not buying that story. Stop fooling yourself. You are not in a summer season. You are in a winter season. And you would do better if you would just recognize that and be honest with yourself. You say, Andrew, 
I'm struggling, mate. I need help. I don't know what to do. Instead of putting on this mask and acting all strong and saying, no, 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 this is my season. And, you know, when you acknowledge your season, you can actually be helped. It's almost, I always have this picture when I think of this, where imagine certain guys can do it. I can't wear shorts in winter, okay? In winter, it's cold. You wear lots of layers, okay? But it's pointless you're in a winter season of life and you wear shorts. I'm fine, I'm fine. No, it's time that you need to layer up because that's what the season calls for. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. You think of Joseph. Joseph, we know, he was not ignorant of the fact that he was imprisoned unjustly for 12 years. Anyone would like that? Going to prison for 12 years for doing nothing wrong. Okay, but what he did there is he kept God of his heart during the season of 12 years until God did something in the second. If you know Joseph's story, it's incredible. He, he, his brothers sell him off because he's the favorite son. They, he gets thrown into a well, into the pit. Then he gets sold to uh, as a slave. Then he gets uh, put in the house. Then he gets falsely accused. Then he gets put in prison for 12 years. And you think, God, I did everything right, and here I am. And then Pharaoh has a dream, and Joseph has the ability by God's Spirit to interpret dreams. And they say, hey, yeah, you know, there's someone down in the jail who's able to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh says, call him up. Joseph comes, he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and in a second, after a 12-year season, he goes from the prison to the second most powerful man in Egypt under Pharaoh. Prison, from prison to palace. If God did it for Joseph, he can do it for us. But the thing is, Joseph wasn't ignorant. He knew what season he was in, and he just responded well. You know, Scripture says that the Lord was with Joseph, and he favored him even in the prison. How's that? God can favor you in difficult seasons. It's not as if God is distant and away when you and I go through difficult seasons. So, so God's going to continue to work in our lives and through our lives, both through seconds and seasons. The big question is, how are you and I going to respond? How will we respond if God doesn't answer as quick as what we would like him to? If we thought this was going to be a two-year battle and this thing's clocking 15, 20 years, would you keep your heart? Would you still love God? Would you still serve God? Or would you abandon him? And so I think it's a good reminder that difficult seasons are not a dead end. Difficult seasons are not your dead end. You should see it more as a speed bump along the journey of life. And I, and I know it's so difficult that in a difficult season, we get overwhelmed and we think, this is me. I'm done. I cannot see. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I'm a finished man. I'm a finished woman. Who's been there? It's not true. Because why? Wisdom tells you that seasons come and seasons go. Who's enjoying this winter? Not me. I'm looking forward to spring. And I know winter's only three months. I just got to hang in there. And then spring's around the corner. It's not actually September when it's warm. October's warm, okay, mid-September. But I know seasons change, and you and I need to know that whatever we're facing is not forever. Whatever you're going through is not forever. It's not a dead end. See it more as a speed bump. So let's go to the Bible and look at how God worked in those people's lives, both in seconds and then also in the seasons. We think of seconds. Moses met God in a burning bush in a second. Imagine that. Imagine that. That wasn't something that took months it was in a second that God revealed himself, spoke to Moses through a burning bush. We know that Paul was on the road to Damascus. He had been persecuting Christians. He, Jesus comes and he reveals himself to him. How? Through a blinding light. Like in a second, Paul is blinded. He can't see for three days. He has to be healed from that blindness. Okay? That happened instantly. That was something that happened quickly. We know Lot's wife. What happened to her? God is busy destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says to them, as you flee... Don't look back. What does Lot's wife do? And then it's because of her disobedience, God punishes her. She turns into a pillar of salt. I would like to have seen that. Who's with me? A human becoming a pillar of salt. You're like, that's far-fetched. God did it. Okay, we've got to have faith with that. I'm like, that happened in a second. That didn't happen slowly. That happened quickly. We know Jesus encountered many people. He put hands on them. And what happened? In a second, he healed them. He healed them. In a second, God can do things quickly, but then God also does things over the long run. We look at how people faced seasons. How many days was Noah on the ark for? How long? Nobody knows. I didn't know either. 
I did know it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but Noah was actually on the ark for 370 days. Imagine, over a year with your family and all these animals. Who could walk out there a sane man? How are you like, a year. That's lockdown of note. Okay, so, so Noah faced that. Paul, we know, was under house arrest in Rome for two years for preaching the gospel, gets arrested. But it was in the prison that, God, that, that Paul wrote prison epistles and he wrote to different churches these letters and, and God worked miraculously through that, that we still read those letters that Paul wrote in Roman prison today. But he had to be confined for two years for that thing to become fruitful. We said Joseph was in prison for 12 years. Abraham and Sarah, God gave them a promise. She was barren. She couldn't have a child. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you an inheritance. You're going to have so many kids. It's going to be compared to the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Uh, he got the promise at 75 years old, okay? Childless at 75. You and I would think we'd die at the age of 75. He gets a promise to have a kid at 75, okay? 80 comes, no Isaac. 85, no Isaac. 90, no Isaac, 95, you're thinking, God must have lied to me. 100, when Scripture says his body was as good as dead. That's when God gave Abraham the promised son, Isaac. They had to wait, him and his wife, Sarah, 25 years. Who's up for that wait? 25 years for your breakthrough. 25 years for your promise. You know, I did a short study and they said, Abraham is credited for nothing in the Scriptures except for waiting. He did no big miracles like Elijah and Elisha or anyone. All he did was he waited. And it was credited to him as righteousness that he waited on God. See, that was a beautiful season. We know the Israelites were in the Babylonian exile for how long? 70 years. That's an entire life. A whole generation. Israelite was out of their homeland. And they had to face that season. And so what we can learn from how God works in these seconds and the seasons in Scripture is, is this, two things, usually, usually, not always, usually our seasons are the result of us. Number one, sorry, number one, God working out his good plans. So we're in seasons because God is doing something that we don't have control of. God is working something in our lives through a season. And secondly, we, you and I can find ourselves in a season and it's the result because of us suffering from our poor decisions. <laughs> Some of us got ourselves to where we are. Who knows that scripture says that God, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whatever you're sowing is growing. That's what you're going to eat. Okay, and more of that just now. But where we are is normally a result of God working out his plans or us suffering from poor decisions. So we think of God's good, perfect plans and how he outworks them. So we know the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. And God does what? He calls Moses, burning bush experience, and he says, you're going to be the deliverer. You're going to take my people out of Egypt, and you're going to lead them to Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was called Cape Town. Okay? And he says, that's where you're going to go. But listen to what happens along the way. They didn't just get there. Look, look what happened. Exodus 13. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter <laughs> it says, for, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the mountain, the long way around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. So you see, God in his kindness was sparing the people. He said, I know it's easier to go along the short route. That's what you and I always want. But God says, I know something that you don't know. I've gone ahead of you. I can see what you can't see. And therefore, I'm going to protect you by taking you along the long road. So don't always think that the short road is better for us. Because what happened there is that the Egyptians had their military outposts along the short road. And God said, you, you're going to get into battle. Not going to go good. So I'm going to protect you. So we've got to also believe that, you know, if things are taking longer than expected, well, then God knows things I don't. <laughs> and I just have to trust him. On, on one occasion, Jesus and his disciples, they come across a man born blind. Born blind. What a life. And immediately the disciples say, well, look, who can we accuse? Whose fault was this? And they said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened, Jesus said, 
so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So before this man was born, God decided he is going to be born blind. We don't always understand why and how God does things, but God said he's going to be born blind so that one day when my son is on the earth, he's going to be healed and he's going to declare to those in that town who I am. It was God's divine plan. I imagine that man's season from being born blind to however old he was when, when he got healed. That would have been a difficult season. He would not have understood it, but hey, he just needed to wait for a second for God to do something and his whole story changed okay the second thing is you and I can find ourselves in a certain season as we said because of our poor decisions I know of two siblings same age they applied for their driver's license and they failed a couple times I'll tell you how many times but let's do this test who got their driver's license first time all the proud people you're like okay second time third time don't get embarrassed at this point. Fourth time. <laughs> Fifth, sixth, ten. No, just... So anyway, so I know the siblings, they, they, their mother had to, or their father had to, to pay for them to go for their license. All hopeful, they'll get it first time. Or, okay, maybe not, maybe the second time, you know, uh, and then third time, and then fourth time. And so these two siblings had to face the embarrassment uh, of friends of saying, oh, I failed again, and again, and again, and they had to Face the pressure as well of saying, listen, if I don't get it the fifth time, what's it going to feel like going for the sixth time? And are mom and dad even going to pay for that one? Okay. But what happened? They kept failing on something small. They didn't flip the car. They didn't crash into anyone. They could have just rolled back. It was something so, so small each time. And listen, for us, this is going to be a bitter, a bitter pill for some of us to swallow. But some of us are facing an extended season of hardship because we're failing to obey God in the small things. You know exactly what God is asking you to do. He's not asking you to make magic. He's not asking you to do anything big. He's just saying, can you please do this one small thing? Either do it or don't do it. And what happens? You and I keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Now, let me say this. We must not do these two things. Number one, we must not think, that every hardship is punishment from God. You know, when you and I face difficult seasons, what we do is automatically go, I want to just go and find the root cause as to why this happened. Surely I must have done something wrong. Life is not that black and white. That for every hard season we face, we were the cause of it and we can now fix it. No. We live, listen, we live in a sinful, broken, and a fallen world. Life is happens bad things happen to good people good things happen to bad people we don't always understand everything but not all difficult seasons are punishment from God do you know that God actually doesn't really punish us anymore Isaiah 53 if we really understand it what did it say the punishment that brought us peace was on him it was a prophecy of Jesus Jesus was punished on the cross for your sin and for my sin so we didn't have to be punished so God is not punishing us for sin. He, he punished his son for our sin. God may deal with us and discipline us, but God is not punishing us in hard seasons. The second thing is don't blame the devil for your poor decisions. The poor devil. The poor devil. The devil made me do it. The devil, the devil, the devil. No, own your own mess. Don't blame the devil for something you did. You had the power to say yes or no to. Okay, for example, Israel. They're in Egypt. God calls Moses and said, you're going to deliver them. And they're going to move from Egypt to Canaan. Who knows how long that trip was supposed to take? Right. Less than two weeks on foot. They were just supposed to go from here to there. Two weeks. All right? A large amount of people. It's not far. What happens is because they disobeyed God, God caused that in entire generation to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation over the age of 20 died out the only two from that older generation that had got to enter the promised land was who Joshua and Caleb why because before God gave them the promised land they sent 12 spies they said go and spy out the land that God said he will give us all right the the the, the 12 spies come back and they asked for the report. The two, Joshua and Caleb, said, we can do it, guys. It's awesome. There's, there's grapes this big. And come on, we're going to go. 
10 of them, the majority said, never. We can't. There's giants in the land. What happened? They did not trust God. God said, I will give you this land. And because they failed to disobey God in something quite small, they didn't get to enter the promised land. And they had to suffer their consequences, except Joshua and Caleb. So our disobedience carries consequences. Here's the good news. God is gracious. You and I will. Maybe this week we did things that were like, why did I do that? And there may have been a consequence with the thing that we, we did. But we can go to God and say, Lord, I am what? Sorry. I can confess. And when we confess, what do we find? Forgiveness. Jesus will forgive us for those wrong things we do. He's not going to hold it against us forever. That's why he went to the cross, because he loves us. But we need to know this, that God's forgiveness erases the guilt of sin. God's forgiveness doesn't erase the consequence of sin. (laughs) So think about it in this scenario. If for any reason I were to take someone's life, I were to murder someone, And I went to God and said, Lord, I realize what I did was wrong. God, I confess it. God, I am sorry. Will God forgive me? Of course. Of course he will do that. But does God then go back to the person that I killed and resurrect them and bring them back to life? No. The consequence remains. Do I go to jail? Yes. Am I forgiven? Yes. It doesn't get me out of jail. I still have to pay the price. So don't confuse forgiveness. Forgiveness is God removing the guilt that I won't be held accountable for this later on in life, especially at heaven's door. But the consequence remains. Don't blame the devil for your stupid decisions. <laughs> All right? The poor devil. Okay? Just own your mess. And some of you are in a season because you got yourself there. And you've got to say, God, help me to get out of this season. And so, so whether God works in the seconds or in the seasons of our life, what do you and I have to do? We have to do exactly what the Israelites did. We have to obey God and we have to trust God. God, I'll do what you want me to do. And even when it doesn't make sense, I'm going to trust that you are sovereign, that you see things that I don't see, that you know things that I don't know. And I'm just going to trust the beauty of trust. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. That's what God wants to do for each one of us. He wants to make our paths straight. And so maybe it feels like you're going on a long route in life. I know many of you feel that way. You're going on the the long route. Just know that God may be using the very thing that's frustrating you, the very thing that you're praying away to propel you into your destiny, to get you to where God wants you to be. You think that can't be. God cannot use this to get me forward. Who knows that God says he works in all things for our good. And so that very thing that's frustrating us, that thing that's overwhelming us, like I said, the thing that we're praying away, God says, no, that's exactly what you need. I'm going to get you to where you need to be. And so if you're facing a season, I want to offer you some perspective this morning. Anyone enjoy red wine? You're like, okay, should I put my hand up in church? Okay. Okay. When it comes to red wine, do you know that certain bottles of wines can sell for thousands, tens, probably hundreds of thousands of rands? Why? It, either because it's a rare blend or simply because of its age. Who knows that if, if you begin the process of making good red wine and you go on day two and you open the barrel and go for some wine, what are you going to get? Liquid fruit, grape juice. You're going to be disappointed. You're like, this is not wine. This is not what I'm expected. So, so how do they get to this beautiful, age-old, rare, expensive, valuable bottle of red wine? They leave it. They just leave it to mature. And, and I think that's a turning point for some of us. We need to go, you know what, this season, I don't like. But I just need to wait. I need, an, I need to trust that God knows what He's doing. God I believe that you're going to mature me. You're going to bring the best out of me through the season. Because I'm going through a bad season doesn't make you not good anymore. God is good and what he does is good. God can't change his nature. It's just that you and I don't always understand what God is doing. And so we love it when God works in the seconds and in the seasons. 
But you know what? It's not always that easy. So let me end with this. Psalm 31 says this. Be strong and take heart. Take heart. Take heart. Listen, your difficult season is not a dead end. It's just a speed bump in the journey of life. Let's pray. And I want you for a moment. I know the Spirit has said something to you this morning, offered you some perspective, godly perspective. Maybe God's just offering you comfort in this moment. Just to let you know that where you are is maybe okay. Or maybe where you are is not okay. And you've got yourself there and you've got to now get yourself out of there. Forgiveness removes the guilt of sin, doesn't remove the consequence of sin. And why don't you take this moment just to give your heart to God. Say, God, help me, strengthen me in this season. God, give me perspective. Lord, your word says I can ask you for wisdom. You give it to everybody without showing favoritism, Lord. Give me wisdom to know how to navigate this difficult season. I'm going to give you a moment. Why don't you just pray to God in your own words in your heart. Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning that we would just have perspective. Lord, that we would consider our difficult season, our struggle, like a good old red wine. That if ended too early, we'll be spoiled. But if we allow it to endure and mature, God, it's going to come out to be something rare, something beautiful, something of great value, Father God. And Lord, we know that it's in the difficult seasons that you define us. It's in the difficult seasons that you refine us. Not all the good things happen in the seconds, God. Some of the best things, the sweetest things you do in our lives happen over a period of time. Lord, if all you ever did was miracles in the seconds, it would almost never require faith from us. But it's in the difficult seasons that we're encouraged to to hang on, to push through, to trust, to pray, to fast, to seek. And so thank you for not always working so quickly in our lives. God, thank you for taking your time most times in our lives. And God, I pray for great testimonies to come of how we've learned just to wait on you Take heart, endure, push through. Reveal yourself in the seconds and in the seasons of life. Amen. Amen. Encouraged? I hope so. Let's stand to our feet. I would love to bless you. You know something? When it comes to seasons of life, One of the worst mistakes you and I make in those seasons is we do it alone. You and I are better together. So much of what God does in our lives happens through other people. And you and I, maybe God doesn't always give us answers to the difficult things we're facing. But what He will do is, if we're willing, He'll bring people across our paths. And those people are the very blessings that we need in those seasons. Good friendships can can come in those spaces. And so if you're struggling... Just be humble enough to say, hey, can somebody join me? Can somebody help me along this journey called life? So I want to bless you with Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. In your difficult season, God can do immeasurably more. Now, would you get of ask or imagine? Good coffee, vegetable soup, 10 rand. And if anyone would like to give today, please visit our giving station.
and you can honor God there. Church, God bless. Have a great, great week.